I didn't come in expecting that people were going to say, oh, you're a black woman from Cabrini. It's all good now. I said to folks, this has been broken for so long, it's going to take us a while to do it. Welcome to New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. Talking to Kim Fox last year was one of the better conversations I've ever had, uh, let alone in front of microphones. The episode was part of our series on the progressive prosecutor movement, and at the time, Fox was about two years into her uh, current tenure as state's attorney for Cook County. Now, Cook County includes Chicago, uh, and it also has the second largest prosecutor's office in the country. Fox has recently announced her intention to run for a second term, and uh, I thought that made for a great reason to uh, revisit our conversation. Fox was one of the first of the recent wave of reform prosecutors to be elected. She ran on a promise to transform and make more transparent the system she would be taking over. And recent reporting, notably from the Marshall Project, about her office's charging decisions suggests Fox is making good on that promise. But Fox, who is the first African-American woman to hold this position, was also greeted from the outset by a campaign of sustained and often pretty vicious opposition. Uh, some of that stems from what she has acknowledged was her mishandling of the Jussie Smollett case, the actor who allegedly staged his own hate crime attack in Chicago early this year. But it's also clear how much that incident has been seized upon by interests that were opposed to Fox from the beginning. But if there's anything that emerges from the conversation you're about to hear, it's that Fox knew nothing about her tenure was going to come easy. So let's listen to my September 2018 conversation now with state's attorney for Cook County, Kim Fox. So this is maybe an odd question to start with for for a state's attorney, but fortunately you're outside of your jurisdiction here. Do you think that prosecutors have too much power? I think prosecutors have a lot of unchecked power, and with that, a lot of obscurity about what they do. No one knows what they do, and so the power seems that much more intense because there's no real way or there has not been a real way to scrutinize it. How do we know that you're abusing your discretion? We talk a lot about prosecutorial discretion, the ability to charge, not charge, what to charge, what to drop, how to divert, all of that in the power of this one office, this one institution, where there's no ability to see what you do, how you do it, or why you do it. Is there a role then for some kind of um, prosecutorial guidelines, uh, yeah. possibly? Absolutely. I, I think, again, because we talk about prosecutor discretion, that word discretion is so heavy. I mean, it is. it allows for there to be huge disparities within the same field. You know, as you talk about reform, it is the ability for me to do some things that I probably, you know, the law says I, you know, have to do one thing. I get to exercise my discretion to do another, right? Um, my choice in, in what charges to bring um, or conversely not to bring. Or, you know, we had a policy around retail theft that is contrary to what the, the state law is. Um, but using my discretion to do it in a way that I think is less harmful. Um, so th it's a loaded concept that could be either used for, you know, good or evil. I don't know what the, the balance looks like other than to start with, I think people should show what they're doing so that we can start asking the question of should you or should you not be doing that? Should you or should you not be allowed to do that? In in a sense, then, it's sort of galvanizing for the reform movement to be able to put a prosecutor in control who ends up, who, who has this kind of uh, discretion that you're talking about. But then it becomes jurisdictional, right? Then it becomes, it depends on where you are. I'm, I'm one prosecutor out of 102 in the state of Illinois. And what you don't also want to create... But you're a large one. I mean, you're the second largest office second in the largest country. Second largest in the country. And maybe, yes, I, I mean, I'd minimize uh, our impact. But the bigger point for me is 
you can drive right across our border and things that I don't prosecute in Cook County, in neighboring DuPage County, you may pay quite the price. And so I think, again, with that disparity in discretion, justice and how justice is administered shouldn't be jurisdictional. It shouldn't be based on your zip code. I mean, I, the things that we're doing in bail reform in Cook County drastically different than what some folks in downstate Illinois want. And how the prosecutor views their role in, you know, downstate Illinois may be very different than how I view my role here. And that disparity, that kind of range of what happens in these offices is really concerning to me um, as someone who went to school in, in southern Illinois and had to, you know, wind my way back up of what happens to me depending on where I stop. And so I think, you know, the point of how do we make sure that prosecutors across the board, that you don't have to be a, quote, reform prosecutor to get justice, you should just be a prosecutor who acts justly is what I think the goal should be. And then I I wanted to ask you a little bit about your um, biography. As I mentioned, you're the first African-American woman to, to lead the office, the second largest prosecutor's office in the country. As almost every profile of you starts, you spent your early childhood in uh, Cabrini Green, the, the public housing complex, and you, you keep a brick from from the building in your office. You've said as well that when you attend uh, like a, a larger family event, there's going to be all kinds of people there who've had all sorts of experiences with the criminal justice system. And that's certainly not the norm, I wouldn't think, for most lead prosecutors across the country who overwhelmingly tend to be white men. So I'm wondering what you think, how you think that perspective influences what you're trying to do with this office. It's funny. My brick, I think, is more famous than I am now. <laughs> uh, people come to my office and are like, where's the brick? I think it's really... I tried to interview it, but it never <laughs> got back to me. It may get its own Twitter page and probably will have way more followers than me. I think it's important to start with my biography of where I come from. Even more so, like the racial demographic of being the first African-American woman in this position... And we know that, you know, people of color, women of color are vastly underrepresented in elected prosecutors' offices. So it's really significant. But I do think of equal important significance is the fact that I come from a community that is very similar to many of the folks in Chicago who experience high incidence of, of crime and violence in their neighborhoods, right? So we, we know that in, in Chicago, it, the crime is not just disproportionate to communities of color, just based on color, it's also income and the disparities that we see in housing, education, health care. And that's what my childhood showed me is like truly we were an island unto ourselves, poverty stacked on top of each other and the residual effects that come with that. And so I think it's really important that we have leadership that is reflective of the communities that they serve, not just based on race or gender. And it's a fact, right? I I think my family dynamic of having people who have been victims of crime, I've been very open that I've been a victim of crime, perpetrators of crime, witnesses. You know, my mother was a victim of domestic violence, but had, you know, this person who was causing harm to her in our home. You know, my brother and I witnessed that and, and the choices that my mother made in that relationship and the residual effect that it had on my brother and I allows you to recognize that there's a complexity to all of this, right? That there's a humanity to this work that I think so often in large institutions people forget about. And for me, I'm rooted in that humanity. I, 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 I don't know any other way to be. There's, it, there's not a space that I can go to to escape the reality of the people that I serve um, on the holidays because, again, I, my family has this mix. My brother lives in a neighborhood that's impacted by violence. I know people, like I said, who've been harmed deeply and personally. So I, I, I think that's really important when you do this work. I see so many people who go into law enforcement and prosecution with this hero complex this I want to save the day, right? The the designation of who wears the white hats versus who wears the black hats. And that 
often makes my stomach churn because it is this belief that you are coming to save someone. And even in the worst of times in the projects when I lived there, it was a community rich in love and support. Everything that was happening, there was still this fabric. We didn't need people to save us. We needed people to support us. And that, I think, is a big distinction for people who have a healthy distance from communities like that. Yeah, and then this this belief that the criminal justice system uh, really relies upon that people can be neatly divided up into right. good and bad and right. victims and perpetrators. Yeah, and that's never the reality. It's right. never. The, it's only on scripted television, right? Like it only on script. But even scripted television is better now, right? That they have like nuances of. You know, you're you're feeling bad for Walter White, right? Like, look at this guy who's a high school, you know, teacher, and he's in this midlife crisis, and he's trying to figure out. You're you're rooting for Walter, right? And then you're like, no, he's a meth dealer, right? And he's doing all these things, and we we shouldn't like drug dealers. But there was e- even a painting of humanity to him. Like, what does this do to his wife? What does this look like for him? That in the justice system, we don't like to do that. Either you've done a bad thing, so you are a bad person, and you must be treated accordingly. And I think that helps us justify punitiveness, right? If you have to think more nuanced about people, then you cannot be wedded to a system that treats everybody the same. So then what what can you do to get your prosecutors rooted in humanity, uh, as it were? I mean, if we think about, um, you know, mitigation, you know, this, this idea of taking people's trauma and victimization and, and years often of really deep deprivation, taking those factors into account uh, as part of a prosecutor's office. I, I, is that something that you can envision happening? I'm trying to. I, I think it is, you know, in our office, I you know, we tend to think of mitigation or tended to think of mitigation as something that defense attorneys put together to, like, minimize the punishment and didn't really pay attention to it. Where We weren't thinking about what are the mitigating factors when we were charging. We weren't thinking about any mitigating factors when we were offering pleas. Like, that just was not in the purview of prosecutors. Let the defense handle that. That's That's their client. And I think the way that I'm trying to talk about what mitigation looks like, what these communities look like, is by talking about my personal narrative, is by saying, listen, you know, don't clap for me. Like, look at you. You made it, right? One of the things I tell people all the time, people ask me, you know, how did you survive? How did you make it? You were a victim of sexual assault and you lived in extreme poverty. You know, all of these things that we know are supposed to, like, hold you down, you made it. And I turn that on its head and say, well, if we know that that was supposed to, (laughs) if that was supposed to frustrate any chance that I had of being successful, why do the people who are doing exactly what is supposed to happen to them, why do we not have any compassion for them? And then people pause and think for a moment and it, because we like heroes we like people I, I liken it to getting past a fence like a hole in the fence but you know that there's still people back there so for me it's trying to get our people to recognize that we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back for the one or two who escape if we know those conditions are lead to negative outcomes we cannot hold our our hands over our ears and pretend like we don't know that And so that's what we're trying to do is, you know, engage our attorneys with narratives, not just of mine, but people who've been impacted by the system, getting our people out of courtrooms, into community, to sit, to listen, and really do some self-reflection on what do we really factor when we talk about this work? Are you really factoring what's in the best interest of the community or what you think is a, a punishment fit for a crime? So when when you spoke, and I think it was on the the, the night of your election about uh, this idea of turning the page, yeah. and I imagine it's really huge book. It's a big book. <laughs> it's a big book. Um, <laughs> what do you understand that that you're? Well, what were you turning the page on? My election was really about talking about the criminal justice system in a way that we hadn't talked about it before. Again, largely prosecutors' races and races in, in Cook County 
the messaging was largely for, you know, people who lived in neighborhoods not impacted by violence, right? The the target audience were some of our suburban communities who had deep fears about violence in the city of Chicago um, and wanted to make sure that violence was contained, that their communities were safe. Um, and that's who the targeting was for. This was a race that I wanted to make sure that we were targeting people who were actually impacted by violence, actually who lived in those neighborhoods, who had people who were both perpetrators and victims in their families in their same bodies and saying to them, this system should be fair to you. Um, We have 86% of the people who were in our jail in 2016 when I ran were black and brown. And most of them had a sense that the justice system only viewed them as an instrument and not as a person. And so I ran the race talking to those communities, talking about the fact that I had more in common with the people who come through our justice system um, than the people who work in the office, and saying that you should expect more. And I think for me, that turning the page was, was that this was an office that had to be inclusive of the entire county that we had to recognize that the disparities that existed were unacceptable um, and that we had to be intentional about doing something about it. And so I think in the large book of the criminal justice system as an institution, we had marginalized people so much that they became footnotes on that page. Um, The turning of the page was actually allowing for those people to be present and represented um, in this office. And, and then a major focus of your campaign and, and uh, ongoing now as part of your tenure is, is trying to strengthen trust, strengthen trust in the criminal justice system. And you've just listed some reasons why, why people have profound distrust of the system. And you were elected in, in the wake of the, the tragic uh, shooting of Laquan McDonald in, in 2014, it's, uh, a black teenager who was shot 16 times by a white police officer, and then the the dash cam video of that was not released by the city for more than a year and only after they were ordered to by by a judge. Um, And in fact, as as we speak, um, jury selection is underway in in, in the trial of the officer for for murder. Your office is recused from from handling the case, and I I don't want to get into the details of that that case here, but you have a very powerful message that's clear to me. But how much as a prosecutor can you do to restore trust? in the system, and, and, and frankly, given everything that's been going on, how hard have you been finding it? I think you have to be honest, right? I, the relationship between our office and, and the community was broken because we weren't honest with the people that we we worked with. The justice system in, in Chicago, long before Laquan McDonald, had been broken, and the relationship had been broken. I think what the conversation in the last four years since Um, His death has certainly been elevated, but this is a city that had, has paid out, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars related to cases of of police misconduct. This is a city that actually teaches a curriculum in Chicago public schools about police torture as a result of litigation that had been ongoing um, related to the torture of black men on the South Side by Chicago police. And so the communities have known for a really long time. You, If you ask some people about Laquan McDonald, that wasn't a turning point for them. They, they it may have been a turning point for other people in the community uh, or in the city or in the county, but for a lot of communities that were impacted, this was just another indication of what they'd known for years, for decades. And so I think if you want to have to build trust, you have to own where you have failed. You have to say, I have done something wrong. I, you know, I, I, I liken it to my, my marriage. I've been married to my husband now for 17 years, and we can't move past <laughs> the, the, the thing that's like got us agitated until one of us says, all right, I did this. I'm taking notes here. Yeah, that, if you want to make it last, you gotta, if you've done something wrong, you have to own it. You have to absolutely own it and then say how you're going to remedy it. And, and you then have to meet people where they are. 
I didn't come in expecting that people were going to say, oh, you're a black woman from Cabrini. It's all good now. I said to folks, this has been broken for so long, it's going to take us a while to do it. But the way that I want you to continue on this journey with me is I will be open with you. I will be transparent. You will see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, Because if I try to sugarcoat it, if I try to spin it, I will lose any hope of you trusting that I'm trying to fix it. Yeah, I mean, not not to be unkind, but in a sense, you are now the face of that failure. I That's mean, right. You, you have to own that failure, as you said. That's right. And it, it's, a, it's a tough role to have. It's a very tough role to have because I, I hear it. I hear people say to me, listen, you're, you're, you're part of the system. You're but one person. You, every day you're locking people up. Every day nothing has stopped the machine from churning. Um, you're saying you want it to do better, but the machine is doing what the machine does. And, and that is a fair uh, assessment. And I think, again, for me, it is, yes, that is, that is what I represent. I'm not an other of it. I am a part of it. And I think that has been really helpful to me in not promising something that I can't deliver because I am a part of it, right? It's easy to, to talk about those prosecutors. There are almost 800 lawyers who speak in my name every single day. And I have to make sure um, that we're doing better because that's my name on the record. When I get letters um, coming from prisons, they're writing those letters to me about harms that have happened to them even before I got here. So there's no um, separating myself out from that. Is that message reaching your, your line prosecutors, do you think? I think there are many people in our office who have recognized that the way that the field of prosecution, not just our office, right, because these are men and women who want to do the right thing, who come into public service, they don't make a lot of money, who have seen harm in communities and want to help, right? And the notion that somehow they have done something wrong is offensive to them. And, and so I think even how I articulate the brokenness of it has to be thoughtful to the fact that you can have good people operating in an institution that is fundamentally flawed without meaning that the people are flawed. And so in that, you know, we did a survey early on in my tenure to ask people, like, what were their thoughts about how we were doing things? And overwhelmingly, the response was people thought that we could do things better. What better was, no one was able to articulate, largely because there wasn't a a space for that. But we know, we see the same people cycling in and out of our justice system. We know the people who are challenged with mental health issues or drug addiction issues who keep coming back and that all of our interventions in the justice system have not worked. That doesn't make them feel good that they keep putting a a Band-Aid on a gaping wound, but that's the only tools we have. So I think for many of our folks, they know that there's something more we could be doing. The question becomes, how do you do it? And then there are some who, again, white hats, black hats, who view this role, view this work as good versus evil. And, you know, evil needs to be rooted out. And some of those folks aren't going to be convinced that, this holistic approach makes sense. I've, I've had conversations where people say, well, just don't do bad things and you don't have to worry about this. Like the, this personal accountability is really, really important. And we believe in personal accountability. But again, and so mitigation doesn't really ring for them. If it's like, I never chose to do that. You never chose to do that. Why should we tr- care more about this person? And those are harder people to touch. And what ultimately may happen or ends up happening is that this may not be the prosecutor's office that you need to work for. Now, given the kind of gun-related violence that Chicago's been been dealing with of late and getting so much attention um, in the press, this might seem like another odd question for me. But this is a series about prosecutor reform. And almost every discussion I have on the topic gets into this idea that prosecutors have to start taking a different approach to offenses involving violence and have to start thinking differently about people who commit violent offenses. Uh, The idea there is that you cannot unwind mass incarceration simply by focusing on 
the nonviolent drug offender, and we have to stop drawing this bright line, as we were talking earlier, between good and evil and violent and nonviolent in a sense. So you have at, you have at least four years to try to move that needle. Yeah. Is that something, and I know there's a, a danger of trying to move too quickly. Yeah. Um, is that something that, that you're trying to move? Yes. I mean, we're having those conversations now. I mean, your point is well valid. There is a, there's a risk always in moving too quickly. Even having kind of this, this fundamental agreement that the justice system is broken, not just by people who've been disproportionately impacted by it, by, you know, but others who realize that we spend a, a lot of money um, on prison and incarceration and it doesn't seem like we're getting a good return on that investment, that when you say, well, all right, if we do everything related to drugs or mental health, we still have this portion here. Um, well, they're saying, whoa, 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 <laughs> I hear you, but I, I, I still want to be safe. And I think for us, it is starting those conversations about what is dosage, right? Like, like we've got mitigation, but we, let's talk about that. What are the factors? What should we consider? We've considered all those things. Now, what is the appro- appropriate dosage of our justice system? If someone has committed a violent offense, is it always 20 years because we feel like 20 feels right? Are we operating on a sense of retribution or rehabilitation? Are we operating on a sense of you should be punished and punishment feels like this? Or I know ultimately you're going to come back out. And if you come out without the requisite abilities to cope in, in, in community, your likelihood of going back is higher. And it, is the longer you're there impact how you'll be when you come out? Those are some of the questions that we're starting to to ask. And I think we have to be really thoughtful about that. We have to, because it is taking people's hands and bringing them along, be able to have research and data that shows, you know, there is no big difference between someone who does six years and eight. Prosecutors, we, we love to talk about the worst case scenario, but that's not most of the folks that we have. We do have some of those folks. Or they're, they're few. We do have a lot of people who have shot people. We do have you know a lot of people who have in, engaged in some pretty violent behavior who aren't going to be in prison for the rest of their lives. They're not. I think less than 7% of the people who are in our uh, Department of Corrections are, are there for life. What are we doing with those other 93%? And if we are not mindful of overdosing and then what happens to those folks when they come back, we're going to continue to have, not just from a, a concern about mass incarceration, but from a public safety standpoint. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. We, because we talk about this as, as, a, as a mass incarceration issue. When we talk about violence, I think you're going to lose a portion of the folks who are like, I don't want to let people out of jail because it's cheaper. I don't want to let people out of jail because, you know, we feel like it's too much. It's we should let people have the appropriate sentence and rehabilitation and reentry because it's safer for all of us. I think that's how we frame that conversation is really important because people will, will tend to want to do the things that are easy. Low level drug offenses is, is easy. And there is a greater distance to the humanity of someone who commits a violent act. I think it's hard for people to see the redemptive value of people who hurt people. When we're talking about this rooted in in humanity message, how does that work, say, when, when you're working with the Chicago Police Department? We've talked a little bit about the risk of maybe going too quickly in reforms yep. and, and, and damaging the institutional relationships that a prosecutor's office needs to function. Um, So I guess I'm wondering what you you didn't, you didn't um, come into the office with the support of the Chicago Police Union. I still don't have the support. And you still don't have their support. (laughs) I I let you say that part. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, how do you manage that relationship? And how do you in tandem, continue to try to push forward with reforms? I think it's important to distinguish uh, the union from a lot of the, the the men and women who they represent, who share the same goals that we do, safe, healthy, thriving communities. 
but I, I think we, again, we've just been honest, right? I, my goal has always been making sure that we do things that are in the interest of community and, and that we're being legitimate in the way that we do them. You know, constitutional policing, I think is something that we should all aspire to. I, I think there's a narrative that is written about you or, or thought about you when you come in and you say the system is broken. Again, that defensiveness that comes, she must be talking about us. You know, we talked about police accountability. I, I think if you talk about a broken, fractured relationship, if we're being honest, we have an issue with police accountability in, in, in Cook County. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars on misconduct cases, but people weren't seeing any repercussions for the people who committed the misconduct. And so even talking about that publicly left some bristling and saying, well, she's she's anti-law enforcement. I've never been anti-law enforcement. I am law enforcement. I am anti-bad law enforcement. That is dangerous to our communities. If people don't trust the police department to be credible and legitimate and fair then they will then find another mechanism to deal with issues in community that may not be good for everybody. We have a a homicide clearance rate in the city of Chicago that is lower than almost any other place in the country. We have a shooting clearance rate that is, I think, 5%. And if you talk to people, there's a myriad of reasons that, that, that those numbers are so low, But the legitimacy of our institution plays in that. And so... And people don't trust a system that's not working for them. It's not working. So I'd rather get street justice. Again, I I know how this works. I've, I've, I've grown up where people don't call the police. We got this. We'll take care of this. Um, And when I was, you know, a kid, some of the times that meant like, people would jump on somebody, right? You'd posse up your group and somebody would go and take care of the person who did the harm and people would move on. Now with an overproliferation of guns, people are doing that with guns. But if we can't get witnesses to come forward because we are viewed as illegitimate, that is dangerous to the community. And so I don't have the luxury of, you know, sugarcoating. I don't have the luxury of like making people feel like, no, not you, not all, not, it's the system. And I'm a part of it. Again, I'm the face of prosecution. You know, there have been cases where prosecutors have been extraordinarily overzealous, um, where we've treated victims who are here, you know, seeking justice horribly. So we have to do something about that. But I think overall, my relationship with law enforcement in Cook County is really good. I mean, I think, again, being transparent, dispels the narrative. People are saying, oh, you're soft on crime. Let me show you what we're doing. Let me show you. And I think when you do that, it dispels what people want to say about you because I think people wanted to have a narrative about what it meant for a black woman to have this job, a black woman from the projects to have this job. I heard she's going to let everybody black out of jail you know so i was gonna ask you about that (laughs) we revamped the conviction integrity unit because it's important to the legitimacy of the work if i moved based on people's assumptions about me negative stereotypical assumptions about me we would not be able to move the needle at all so you have a lot of relationships to manage we've talked about the police relationship line prosecutors uh your husband (laughs) (laughs) um then on the other side, yeah. and it occurs to me to go back to this metaphor that you're trying to move a needle stuck yeah. between a rock and a hard place, you have the activists and you have the people who uh, worked so hard to get you elected and have invested so much yeah. uh, hope in you. I read this this great profile by the Chicago and uh, Steve Bogira yeah. for the Marshall Project of you. And, and in there, you and he talk about the fact that, you know, you are or were the darling of the <laughs> activists, and you also suggest that you don't expect that that's going to last for too long. <laughs> so yeah, are you, could, do you think that, it, and there's been this tremendous movement for reform across the country, does, yeah. does it concern you that maybe people are almost expecting too much from, from quote unquote reform-minded prosecutors? It's a great question. I think people have been so sorely disappointed by our justice system that they want and deserve a lot more than what they've gotten. 
the system has has operated in a way for so long that I don't think it's unfair that people want a lot from me at all. I get it. It's an interesting place to be as a prosecutor where people are are celebrating you as a prosecutor when every day we are prosecuting. Um, Every day, five days a week, um, seven days a week, we we talk about bond court. We are depriving people of um, their freedoms. And some people may agree with what we're doing or don't do, but that is our role is to prosecute. And so there's this this tension between wanting to make sure that we do it right, that we're fair, we're just, we're equitable, that we're treating people humanely, but in a paradigm that is built on an institution that is that was racist. But the institution is still functioning. And so I, for me, it is an interesting tension because I am still a prosecutor. So managing that expectation, I don't think it's unfair. I don't think it's an unfair expectation. I think for me, it is hey, I've been here almost two years in an institution in in Cook County, at least it has existed for well over a century, where, you know, the people who ran this office didn't have the same set of experiences, you know, hadn't had a perspective that I think allowed them to fully grasp what the impact would be. Maybe well-intentioned, but So I'm coming in and trying to manage those relationships. You know, there are things outside of my control with police, but I try to work with them, um, manage my prosecutors so that we're operating on the same level, manage a gun epidemic and a violence epidemic in a city that I love that is absolutely remarkable, but it is remarkably heartbreaking that in 2016 we had 762 people who were killed. Um, that this year alone we have over 70 children under the age of 15 who have been shot. Like, those realities are are real, and I have to juggle all of those things. And so, you know, what my hope is is that we continue to strive, um, that we don't lose the aspiration to have this system be fair and just and equitable and responsive, And knowing that the needle is stuck between a rock and a hard place doesn't mean that we don't try every day to to bend it, to break it, to fix it. But with the harsh reality of history and time telling me that it's going to take longer um, than the people deserve. So I I wanted to end with a kind of a big picture question, I guess, similar to the big picture question I asked off the top. Um, and that is often in in several interviews now, people have have talked about this idea of having a criminal justice system that's more rooted in humanity. Bruce Western, a sociologist, was just here talking about uh, criminal justice as social justice. Mm-hmm. And I asked him my kind of classic pushback question to get an elicit a good response, uh, which was, well, what are you going to say to the skeptic who says that's just not the lane of the criminal justice system? <laughs> And then I was reading Steve Bogueira's profile, and somebody in there <laughs> throws this idea at yeah. you about that's not the lane of the criminal justice system. Yeah. And oh, the prosecutor. A prosecutor. Yeah. You dismissed this whole um, lane conceit in um, no uncertain terms, yeah. which has <laughs> made me reluctant to ever ask the question again. But instead, <laughs> I'm doing it here in this self-critical way. So can you... Tell me why you shouldn't even be asking that question as a, just a sort of pushback question at all. That we shouldn't be thinking about lanes for the criminal justice system. We shouldn't. I mean, fairness, justice, equity, like, who owns that? I, again, it goes back to the point uh, I was making earlier about mitigation. You know, oh, you know, is is are we fully recognizing all the things that make this defendant the defendant that's not for us to care about. That's for the defendant to care about. That's for his attorney. And if he doesn't tell us and we don't know, that's not on me. That's how you allow institutions to fester and remain broken when people say, I just got to worry about my cog here. If my cog is only, did you commit a crime? Can I prove it? What is your punishment? Without the thought of, is this fair? Is this right? Who are you? What do you actually need? What are the ripple implications for your community? Um, What will be the impact 
years from now on not just you but your community if i'm just in my cog of i'm a prosecutor my job is to charge you convict you and sentence you we will have the system that we have i mean that that is how we've gotten here is this almost absolution of responsibility for the people who have that much power with little transparency who don't have to be responsible for their policies and their actions because that's somebody else's issue and and so i think in the justice system we acknowledge all of these big ideas that we pretend that this broken system can fix we all acknowledge the people who have mental health issues don't belong in our jail to as as a response to their mental health issues. The the homeless man who is exposing himself outside of Starbucks, who gets arrested for indecent exposure and is brought in our jail and we have nothing to do for him. We just will keep churning because I I can't care that he's homeless or that he's mentally ill. That's he exposed not my himself. Lane. That's not my lane. He's he exposed himself. That is my lane. If we operate like that, this is what you get. This is, it, it makes people feel good about the system that they have is that I'm just doing the part that I'm supposed to do. And I think as prosecutors, to take it back to the beginning, we have such a tremendous responsibility with the discretion. I mean, that is, it is such a powerful tool. I think it's irresponsible to believe that you have this narrow space to fill when every decision that I may make has a long-term impact, not just on that individual, but that community. So I, I don't believe in lanes. Well, neither do I anymore. <laughs> um, Kim, I want to thank you so much uh, for making the time to come. Of course. Visit us here from the remarkable city of Chicago, and we're going to keep uh, looking on, on on the work that you're doing there. Thank you. Thank And thanks for the, the profile on the work. I know the last couple years, there has been this greater conversation, and I've read John Pfaff's book, too. Um, and Who started off this Prosecutor Power series, he, actually. Yeah, I know. That's why I, the I, inevitable I, John Pfaff. I'm giving John his, his just due. Um, and not that I agree with everything that John says, but I think it is an important conversation that he has started. I think the level of scrutiny that these races are having, I will say— when I ran in 2015, you know, the, the Chicago Tribune, who is the more conservative paper in, in the city, gave me their endorsement. They did their editorial. And, and I had been talking about mitigation and talking about kind of the wholeness of the people that we serve. And they had this caveat of, you know, we endorse her, but we don't want her to be the public defender. We want her to be the prosecutor. And I a lane idea. A I, lane I idea. Point out. Yeah, and I was stewing for a while. I still stew about it. Obviously, I'm bringing it up, but I, I find it fascinating that in Boston, the candidates who were running for district attorney in Boston held a debate at the jail, at the county jail. So you talk about in three years. A race that is, you know, trying to be inclusive and in, in incorporating the people who are impacted while calming the fears of, you know, our suburban constituents to three years later, having the DA sit in jail and say, how are you going to serve me is really incredible. And I think that shift has been because of work, the work of John and others and activists who say that this is the expectation we should have. So it's been for me, work like this, having these conversations, the other people who are working on this issue, a really fascinating thing to watch. Because it's not just let's get the next new hottest person um, into this this work. It's the constituency who says, you need to come talk to me. Right. Um, and then responding with victory. Uh, is really remarkable. So I, I really appreciate the work that's being done on that. No, it's the feeling that the that the ground had really shifted that was the impetus for starting this series, um, yeah. I don't know, six, eight months ago. So, I mean, to have you now here as our fourth guest in this very intermittent um, <laughs> series is, is, is really meaningful. Yeah, thank you. So I thank you again. So that was my conversation with Kim Fox from September of last year. She is the state's attorney for Cook County, Illinois. 
And as you just heard, the interview with her was uh, part of a series we did on the progressive prosecutor movement. You can find uh, all of those episodes with the likes of Larry Krasner, Emily Bazelon, and Marilyn Mosby at courtinnovation.org slash prosecutorpower. A couple of quick updates from when we recorded uh, that interview. One is the uh, DA candidate debate in the Boston jail Fox referenced. Uh, Rachel Rollins was among the debaters, uh, and she went on to be elected DA of Suffolk County. And Rollins actually cites Fox as uh, an inspiration for her decision to run. Uh, You can hear an interview I did with Rollins in April of this year by scrolling back a bit in your feed. Then in the Laquan McDonald case Fox and I discussed, the officer who killed McDonald, Jason Van Dyke, was found guilty of second-degree murder. He received a seven-year sentence. For more information about uh, Kim Fox and some suggestions for uh, further reading coming out of the episode, visit courtinnovation.org slash Kim Fox. This has been New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. Thanks for listening.